10.7% of GDP if we use a standard economic, economic method of calculating that figure. 0.7 to 2% of GDP over the next 100 years, not a particularly alarming figure, even if we were to do nothing. So if we take the central case then, which is the UK Treasury's case, a discount rate of 3.5%, uh, it is 6.5 six times more expensive to make global go, go away with measures worldwide to uh, make it go away that are as cost effective or ineffective as the Garno's proposals as it is to do absolutely nothing. Six times more expensive to do something than to do nothing. This, and I've analysed a lot of investment appraisals in my time and working for Margaret Thatcher, I have never seen so cost ineffective and a use, or rather I should say, an abuse of taxpayers' money. Correct. Let's take a few more examples very quickly. The EU's carbon trading, we've already got this scheme. And what we've done here is to take Bjorn Lomborg's estimate that the actual gross cost of the trade should be multiplied by 2.5 to take account of all other costs associated with it. 28.8% of GDP compared with Stern's 20% of GDP maximum cost. If we were to put in place the waxman markey cap and trade bill of the states, they said it was only going to cost 2.1% of GDP, but hey, that was a highly biased government estimate, so we don't believe that any more than we believe the 4.2%, which was the UK's estimate under its climate change bill. When you get these airy government estimates, they're always... <coughs> bending the result in a disgraceful way. Let's now get back then to a specific example of how you might spend the money. You might build the world's largest wind farm. We've just done it off the coast of Kent at a subsidy of a mere two billion pounds. We really are on the wrong side of this debate, ladies and gentlemen. Two billion pounds to one wind farm. Uh, two billion uh, dollars, I should say. And that is 28% of global GDP. It's much the same as the EU carbon trading scheme, it's much the same as what Garno's thing comes out at. You can see how very, 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 very expensive it is to try to make global warming go away, even then, on the basis that the amount of warming that we get is anything like as high as they suggest, which of course it isn't. So in fact, all these figures would come out much worse. If you take a little small wind, you know, this gesture politics is the thing, we've all got to have a windmill on our house, and it's a fashion statement. Yeah. Well, then you're looking at 400% of GDP will be gobbled up in forestalling global warming over the next 20 years, the lifetime of that movement. That is how silly all of this actually is. In any case, the West isn't the problem. Why? Because China's the problem. That circle bit of the graph is from the statistical communicators of the Peking regime. That's how much they are going to emit. They're going to build a new coal-fired power station once every three or four days until 2030. So we are no longer the problem, and therefore not the solution. That's Australia along the bottom there, that green line. Suppose everybody had complied with Kyoto, that's how much difference there would have been to global temperature in a hundred years' time. But nobody has complied with Kyoto. Lots of talking, zero action, and in any case it wouldn't have made any difference even if everybody had complied. All of this is just egregiously, staggeringly senseless. If only they would stand back this governing class of ours and blink and think what a difference it would make. So the, the bottom line on the economics really is that it's far, far cheaper to do what is circled there, to adapt in a focused way to any changes that might occur than to try to prevent them occurring by controlling or regulating or taxing or trading CO2. But there's also a political cost, which has been touched upon by our chairman earlier. The Copenhagen Treaty spoke of setting up a world government. There is the word government used in that context in the draft of the treaty, Annex 1, paragraph 38, for the first time in any treaty that I've read, and I've written quite a few in my time. And here it is used again. This government was going to take absolute power throughout the world in the name of saving the planet. And they were going to take away the free market and set the market rules from the centre. No more free market. This was going to be communism at last, worldwide. The vast economic cost, a whole array of taxes, cap and trade was going to be worldwide, the ETS. And here are the, in full, 
the democratic provisions for the election of that world government by secret ballot. Uh, and no, it's not a defect in the slide, there aren't any. Not in the 186 pages of that treaty. No references to the election or control by any democratic process of this world government. So we're not talking of just world government theory. This is what they tried to do. They failed. I exposed it. Others exposed it. They failed. Thank God they failed. But they tried again at Cancun. And this is what they did. These are just a few of the world government bureaucracies that they established under the Cancun Treaty in Mexico in December of last year, a year after Copenhagen. And you'll see just a few of them, and a few more and more and more and more and more and more and more, and indeed more. Nearly a thousand, not bureaucrats, a thousand new bureaucracies for which you are already paying. Will these bureaucracies make any difference to the planet? Yes, they will. Every time you transfer powers from your elected hands here to the unelected hands of these people, democracy dies. And we are indeed fighting for our freedom, our democracy, and our prosperity. Very, very high stakes in this game. And you need to understand that. It's not just an economic question. It's not just a scientific question. It's an extremely serious political question. It's a question of your freedom as well as mine. And so there is also a moral dimension to this. And we're very close to the end now. And the moral dimension is this. That the more CO2 a country emits, the longer its people live. And the fewer of its children will die. This result is well known, it's well established, but you won't see it mentioned in the mainstream newspapers. You won't see it mentioned in the ABC. Very good. And what they would really like to, to, to see, these Greens so-called, is that the energy source for Africa will be timber. It will be carried and transmitted on the backs of the people, and its use will be in smoke-filled huts, where the children die as a result of respiratory diseases. That's the future if you don't have the electricity, which we are fortunate so far to be able to take for granted. Your Greens and your government are working on that. Day. And here is how people live in Haiti, our fellow creatures. They live on mud pies made with real mud. And before the hike in world food prices by double a few years ago, you could buy a mud pie for three US cents. As a result of the doubling of world food prices that came directly from the biofuel scam, so that food was no longer grown, instead it was fed to clunkers that didn't need it, and half of the corn maize that's produced in the United States now goes to motor cars and not to people. The hike in world food prices that resulted directly from this policy put up the price of these mud pies from three cents to six. And people began to die in very large numbers because they could be kept alive by these, just about, not easy, but they could. Without them, they couldn't. All because we are airily talking about carbon taxes and other complete irrelevancies. We are killing our own people now. Here is what Herr Jean Ziegler had to say about this, the UN's right to food rapporteur. When millions are going hungry, it is a crime against humanity that food should be diverted to biofuels. A crime against humanity. His phrase, not mine. That is where we are once again with our consensus. Killing people by the millions and not even counting how many we kill. There have been food riots in a dozen major regions of the planet just in the last few years, how many of you have seen them reported anywhere in the ABC? <laughs> because they don't care to tell you what their cruel policy of consensus is doing yet again. Killing poor people who have no voice before they're killed and certainly no voice after it. Again, it is an outrage. And what could we be doing with the money? Supposing we captured the global cooperation, which has at least been the one positive outcome <laughs> of this whole global warming scam. And we redirected it towards, for instance, saving the sight of people in Africa who might otherwise die of trichiasis, a repeated infection 